I've been learning Asian martial arts for 40, over 45 years. At this stage, the older I get, the better I was. <laughs> in, in Chinese martial arts, the tiger is ferocious and swift. But the tiger only acts on instinct. You strike a tiger, and he'll strike you back. The dragon is more formidable. You hit a dragon, and he may hit you back, or he may take your momentum and use it against you, or he may run away. The dragon thinks first and responds second. I'd like to tell you the story of an ugly duckling who became a dragon. When I was a child in the 60s growing up in Indiana, being Korean American meant classmates sticking their fingers in the corners of their eyes to make fun of mine, getting in fights while being called chink or nip, then running home to my mother who said, that's silly, you're Korean. <laughs> being punished with three of my siblings for something only the youngest had done wrong, my parents' way of teaching us Confucian values. Being spanked by my parents and told, if you cry, I'm going to hit you harder. It was, it was only years later that I discovered that they were taught to never cry when being hit by the Japanese. When I was a teenager growing up in Michigan in the 70s, being Korean American meant entries in my yearbook that said, Dear Chink, Dear Nip, Dear Ho Chi. My parents telling me the only measure of success was straight A's. My father constantly, constantly threatening, if you don't marry a Korean, you're dead to me. With no information to the contrary, being Korean American meant not only had I been raised oddly, but that I was physically different and therefore ugly and inferior. I started college knowing in my soul that being Korean American was a birth defect inflicted on me by the creator. But then something unexpected happened. I needed a non-science course, so I took Intro to East Asian Studies. The professor wrote the Chinese character Ren on the board. It means human-heartedness, the quality that separates man from animal. It's also the generation name that my father gave me. For the first time in my life, somebody told me something positive about being Korean that was relevant and accessible. This was a revelation. By the end of the semester, I was hooked. I switched my major from pre-med to East Asian studies, even though when I told my parents, they acted as if I'd killed a busload of school children. <laughs> but I needed to learn how being different didn't mean I was ugly. After graduating from Michigan, I went to Korea for a year. I didn't know it at the time, but I went in search of myself. Being in Korea changed, challenged my basic assumptions. My sagobangshik, my way of thinking, was beginning to change. I also gained two crucial insights into my parents and how they raised me. The first insight came after I'd been in the country only a few months. I made the most amazing discovery. Everybody had black hair and brown eyes. <laughs> Back home, I'd see red, yellow, brown, and in Berkeley, purple or green hair. <laughs> but in Korea, the norm was homogeneity, not diversity. I began to understand that if I had been raised in Korea like my parents, I think that black hair and brown eyes was the most proper, most normal, most beautiful thing, and anything else would seem strange. But I didn't understand the rest of the story until decades later. I was teaching Korean American studies at San Francisco State, chatting with my office mate about the, the cultural genocide committed by the Japanese during the occupation. He pointed out to me that for my parents, having their children marry other Koreans was a form of resistance, making sure that Korean people and Korean culture never disappear. The second insight came from learning the Korean language. I couldn't speak Korean, I couldn't speak our language until I was 21 years old. So I went to Yonsei University. I now speak Korean like a six-year-old missionary with a speech impediment. <laughs> When I first got to Korea, I was insulting everyone and their dog, <laughs> saying, come up da to the doorman. Oh, thank you, dearie. Commanding the ajima at the grocery store, hana fanta jomjo. Hey, give me a fanta soda. And telling the family dog, oh, keshi, ichogoro shipshio. <laughs> oh, honorable dog, sir, please proceed this way. <laughs> Growing up in America, I was used to a flat, egalitarian language. But Korean is based on hierarchy. Before I could open my mouth, I'd have to establish the pecking order. <laughs> Speaking Korean is great, as long as you're the senior. But if you're the junior, it can suck. 
You chamo, you eat your emotions. Nunchi, picking up nonverbal cues, is a necessary survival skill. Thinking, as a Korean, can make it near impossible to self-advocate or speak truth to power. These became... You can, <laughs> These became important lessons when I became a parent. Raising my twins, I didn't want to be a tiger parent. I wanted to be a dragon father. Thinking first, filtering my experiences being raised by two loving and well-intentioned immigrant parents and modifying my parenting in light of what my children are facing. I tell my kids, I love you to their faces out loud and often. I want to be understood more than obeyed. So I explained my re the reasoning for my decisions to my children. And as they've gotten older, I encourage them to speak up and tell me when I'm wrong. And they've gotten really good at it. <laughs> I try to remember that the way I treat my daughter sets the bar for the way she expects other men in her life to treat her. And before I treat my children the way my parents treated me, I think, is this consistent with my love, my respect, and my hope for my children? And if it is, I do follow my parents' example. And if it's not, I try to find a better way. Being Korean American means many things. Many things. Having a grandmother who feeds you until you can't move. <laughs> debilitating kimchi cravings at 3 o'clock in the morning. Knowing what tenjan chige, fermented soybean soup, really smells like, but eating it anyhow. <laughs> but most importantly, being Korean American means we have the privilege and the burden of synthesizing our lives from two diverse cultures. We need to be informed and intentional about what we bring to the party, but most especially how we parent our children. They are our legacy, our hope for the future, and how the very best or worst of Korean culture will survive. Thank you.